who here is ready for an exciting video about core design philosophy. This video is going to be fairly short. I'm going to take care of a couple things on screen, say some things, then fade to after I've made most of the changes. It's going to take me this long to do everything I want, and watching me make the clickety clicks for the whole time is boring even by my standards. I'll start by replacing the fallen artillery general with the backup one, refilling both batteries to 14 cannons, and selecting the accuracy perk for both of them. Then, I'll select the new perk for the four other brigades you see on screen. Two of them will receive the sniper perk, the other two the fire rate bonus, and give them temporary names based on the selections so that I can keep track of them during all this. Also, it's time to use the reputation points, since the next stage is the list resetting grand battle. Also, the stage after that is also a grand battle, which will reset the list again. So not only do I have to choose from the stuff here now, I also want to save some rep for next stage's options. I have that right, Panda? What do you usually get? Great. I think I'll do something completely different. If anyone is curious to know what is available at all times, I'll place a link to the relevant wiki page. For situations like this, it's quite useful. Anyway, the manpower bonus is nice, and the money bonus is real nice, but both are just straight up way too expensive to grab. Of the four weapons choices, I'd love to get the Enfields, but again, that's too high a cost for my taste, and there's a slightly better deal on them coming next stage. The Fayettevilles have amazing stats, but they are an infantry weapon, not a skirmish one. And that's just not enough of them to be useful to my usual strategies. Also, there are three generals I can pick up, though given there are two major generals, the lone brigadier general is less appealing. So the Parrots, the Whitworths, and two major generals, each costing six, and I have 23 points, so I can grab three of those at most. That will leave me with 5 points left over, and I get 15 points for winning Gaines Mill. So I'll have 20 to throw around next stage, and looking ahead, I want about 19, so that's perfect. This will actually be the final time I can pick up the scoped Whitworth sniper rifles in the entire game, at least playing as the CSA, so I'll grab those and the two major generals. I can make do with the 9 10 pound parrots I have in my armory for Gaines Mill, and I even have a plan for them and by leaving my reputation at 25, I don't even suffer a morale penalty. Yay! I'm now going to use the officer creation trick to make four cores, four divisions in each of the first three cores, and three divisions in the fourth, and then set up all of my cores so that I can display my long-term goals. Be right back. Okay, I'm done. First off, I want to say that this isn't going to be how I arrange these cores to bring to Gaines Mill. In fact, if I click the other cores right now, you'll see that two of them are completely empty, and one only has a few spillover brigades in it. I'll take care of that in the next video. What you see on the screen now is just for informational purposes, regarding my long-term plan through the end of the campaign. As the game progresses, the number of cores we bring to Grand Battles will increase, with the number of required cores to bring to a fight topping out at 3. To that end, I tend to make my first three cores the same generalized, multi-purpose design, so that any of them can fit in any given situation. Please note that there is a long way to go in this game. While I may have named my brigades already, that does not mean that they have all the perks or equipment yet that will allow them to fill their specialized roles. Again, this is a long-term demonstration. Said generalized design is as follows. The first division is comprised of three sniper-class brigades. The sniper teams will top out around 1,700 men. The number's a bit flexible, but since these three brigades are the ones you want doing the most damage per shot, the idea is not to push them beyond the point where adding more troops reduces overall damage. In case you've forgotten the link to the study done on these numbers, 
which is fair, that video came out two months ago, I'll place the link in the description again. The other reason for that soft limit on the size of the sniper squads is because they are one of the two types of brigades that are the first to get their hands on any new infantry weapons, once I get enough of one to equip a whole brigade. The other such priority brigade are the mid-range teams. Between the two, the sniper teams get preferential treatment on guns with high range and accuracy, and the mid-range teams get preference on the guns with high fire rate. The sniper teams will always take the accuracy perk for its T2 selection. The first and third perks are a bit more fluid, though the stamina for T1 and the spotting for T3 are always reliable choices. The second division has three mid-range brigades. As said before, they get preferential treatment for the acquisition of new weapons with priority to fire rate. For their T2 perk, they will always choose the fire rate option, with the T1 and T3 perks again being fluid choices but with stamina and spotting always reliable. The mid-range squads, however, can, and some probably will, be pushed all the way to the max size of 2,500 men, provided I have the guns to supply them. The reason is that, while the sniper team's job is to maximize damage per shot in an economical fashion, the mid-range team's job is to be able to engage in prolonged firefights with opponents as necessary, oftentimes getting shot at by two or more brigades while holding an important strategic location. Therefore, the higher rate of fire means a higher rate of morale regain, which is crucial to making sure they don't break and run from a critical location. The third division has my Sniper Skirmisher Squad and three vacant brigades. The Sniper team I've gone over in detail before, but as a refresher, I take the Speed at T1, the Accuracy at T2, and the Spotting Stealth combo at T3. The ideal size for a sniper team is 375 men, though pushing it to 390 or so to cover any minor losses is fine, as long as you have the guns for it. The three vacant brigades are to an eventual cavalry team. I'll save going over cavalry numbers and perk choices until I actually have cavalry to field, but it will either be two or three squads, and the mix of skirmish to melee cavalry is rather dependent on personal choice. I'll be going with one skirmish and the other one or two are melee, as skirmish cav take more micromanagement, and one skirm cav to go with my one skirmish sniper per core is about the level of precision micro I want to be at. As for the cannons, I have three batteries in divisions one and two, and two or three batteries in division three depending on my cavalry choices. They are broken, da broken down into long range, mid range, and close support batteries. All batteries will take the Stamina perk at T1 and the Accuracy perk at Tier 2. The Long Range batteries will cap out at the damage per size maximum of 14 guns, take the Long Range Training T3 perk when able, and be equipped with the highly accurate Long Range guns. Early to mid game, these will probably be 10 pound Ordnance, 10 pound Parrots, or 10 pound Tredjigars. Late game switching to Whitworths or 20 pound Parrots as they become available. As they tend to be way back, they are also a good place to put high experience officers, equally useful against infantry or in the counter battery role. The mid range batteries will cap out at the damage per size maximum of 14 guns, take the long range training T3 perk when able, and be equipped with guns that, well, let's just say should be plentiful. The Napoleon is a good choice, as is any 10 pound ordnance cannons that got removed from their role as a long range gun towards endgame. They can do counter-battery work if necessary, but are better suited to being in a position where they can hit enemy infantry at a medium range where they can use their explosive shot. Close support batteries will cap out slightly above the damage per size maximum, being around 16 or 17 guns. They will take the short range training T3 perk and be equipped with guns that are best at close-in fire support, which tends to mean the 6-pounder or 12-pound howitzer for most of the game, then swapping to the massive 24 pound howitzer towards the end. Though in the middle period, feel free to use Napoleons or 10 pound ordnance if you have a glut of them. They will be over the 14 gun number because they will be pressed in close to the infantry in front of them, maximizing their chance of using shell and canister shot, but at the trade off of them taking a lot of collateral damage. So by having a slight buffer above the limit, they will perform well to start and then actually increase in performance as a battle drags on. And lastly, the 4th Division. It's made up of 6 infantry brigades of 2 types. The 1st Brigade is a melee specialist brigade. 
Equip it with Palmettos if possible, or Springfield 1842s if not, but it should always be maximum size and led by a highly competent general. It will take Stamina as its T1 perk, and the melee perks for Tier 2 and 3. Note that if you find this brigade getting a lot of melee training, to the point it maxes its melee skill before assigning melee perks to it, you don't have to choose those perks. It's just that, the way this game plays out, it's rare to have a brigade get high in melee training while also not having to do tons of replacements every stage, which is highly cost prohibitive if you try and use all veterans. Melee perks allows you to use a fair number of rookie replacements while keeping the melee skill high. The other five brigades are what I like to call Scrub Brigades. They tend to range 2,000 to 2,500 men in size, and their job is to be frontline fodder for fights, especially in areas not so important as to warrant one of the mid-range units. For the T1 perk, take Stamina, and they get equipped with whatever your lowest form of weapon tends to be. Farmers, Reboard Farmers, or the 1842 Springfields. Basically, they are the cheap filler of each division. As to what to give them for the Tier 2 perk, the answer is a promotion out of the Meat Grinder. Scrub Brigades are how the more specialized brigades start out their life. Once a Scrub Brigade secures a second experience star, that's when you ideally move it to another core, choose whether it will be a Sniper, Midrange, or Melee, re-equip it, and take the appropriate T2 perk. Then you refill its vacated brigade slot with a brand new Scrub Brigade. The fact is, while you may get more loot per falling enemy in this difficulty than the higher ones, even here at the medium difficulty you still simply won't have enough high tier guns to equip whole cores of troops, so you have to figure out a way to work in your older equipment. Scrub Brigades is how I do it. Scrub Brigades also work hand in hand with the Melee Specialist Brigade for melee charges by using a phased movement pattern. I've used it in this small scale in some previous stages, but I'll demonstrate it in earnest when I get to a stage that I make a full divisional charge. So that's how the first three cores are arranged, but there is one other major difference to them, and that's their usage. I always put my highest experience brigades into the first core, and after the first dozen or so stages, stop using them except in the grand battles. Reason being is that replenishing brigades with veteran troops costs more the more experienced the brigade is. So beyond a certain point, the cost of using your elite brigades keeps growing more and more difficult to maintain, unless you replace losses with rookies, but then they will quickly no longer be your best brigades. So I have the three cores handled by three generals. Whichever one is the one I'm currently using for side missions, I'll place a general in charge who has the bonus experience T1 perk, and for the other two, the general in charge will use the T1 movement speed bonus. How about the last core? Well, for starters, I want to say I only use four cores. The fifth core would open up with the tenth point in army organization, but I don't usually spend that point, so the fourth core is the last core in this makeup. Fourth core serves two purposes. First is, never fill it up beyond three divisions. The fourth divisional slot is used so that you can move entire divisions between cores if needed. Second, fourth core holds any troops that are out of action for one reason or another. Say if, after a grand battle, you find yourself having some brigades that you just can't refresh due to a lack of guns or money. You can slide them here while you farm up a couple side missions and one of the smaller, scrubby brigades that I tend to have sitting in this core can take its place for a bit. Also, since no battle requires more than three cores in this game, you can also use 4th Core and its semi-scrubby standard brigades as a backup core in the grand battles if you feel that one part of said battle would benefit from having more guys to throw around. Lastly, I have a couple names to highlight. Hexamer Snipers are now officially the Snipesmers, and Alfred007, a critical contributor to my Warzone 2100 series, wanted a long-range artillery battery. Specifically, he wanted me to name one the Sylvestrin, so here it is. I'll try not to let this one lose its commanding officer there, Alfie. So that's the core design. Three cores made up of a cannon and sniper division, cannon and mid-range division, and cannon and specialist division, and a scrublord division, and fourth core as my ragtag bunch of misfits. 
As for what I'm going to do for Gaines Mill, since I don't have enough forces for all that just yet, I'll set up the army next video. Good day.